this is what will happen every single time. The band will play, right? And I play the part. Like, I play the song. Yeah. And whenever it's time for me to solo, you know what happens? Everybody walks off stage. (laughs) Welcome to episode 53 of the Bay Shed Podcast. My name is Ryan Roberts. On the episode is bassist, composer, and producer Anthony Crawford. Uh, Anthony tours with Virgil Donati, uh, used to tour with Alan Holdsworth. He'll talk about his time with Erica Badu. He'll talk about uh, how he kind of got discovered and recognized by a lot of high profile artists, which I think is a very fascinating story. Uh, and honestly, honestly, really inspiring. Uh, I typically regularly get inspired by pretty much every guest. Uh, that's been on the podcast and for one way or another I'm inspired by their story and Anthony's was very very inspiring to me um, about having an online presence Uh, so it's really it's I had a great time talking with him I had a great time talking with him D Lake and Bases go to www.dlakeandbases.com check out what Dan Lakin is up to over there he is building custom bases feel free to hit him up and he will build you the base of your dreams and you can talk with him and his design team pick all the the colors the body woods the the shape of neck everything it's your custom base hit him up for that dan is also a distributor for amp companies and so i am playing the demeter vtbp m 800 d wow i can't ever get over how long of a product name that is anyways amp head is amazing um, and uh, I got that from Dan D Lake and bases. He's dealing with Demeter amps. Go to D Lake See what else he is up to shoot him an email and tell him you are a friend of Ryan Roberts from the base shed lemur music.com. Everything you need for the double base can be found at lemur music.com. Lemur has teamed up with the Silver Lake Music Conservatory, which is the school that flee from the Red Hot Chili Peppers owns. And they are doing the 5K Funk Run June 19th and 20th to raise uh, scholarship money for the school and uh, music education. Lemur is a part of that. And I love that Lemur is a part of uh, scholarships and things like that for music education. Again, go to lemurmusic.com. Everything you need for the double bass. Uh, I will be hitting them up shortly because I need some new upright strings. Trickfish amplification. I've been playing the minnow. I've been playing the preamp, the minnow, which is absolutely amazing. Um, what were what was my time with it this week? I went to a rehearsal the other day and I walk into a backline situation. The amp there, I know what the amp's going to be. The amp is not desirable by any means. <laughs> Uh, but, but, you know, it, it beat actually lugging mine. (laughs) So, um, yeah. So I brought my bass, my electric and I brought the minnow. Boom. Done. I love the minnow. Can't say enough about the minnow by Trickfish, um, a Trickfish amplification. Today's guest, Anthony Crawford is also an endorser of Trickfish amps. Stop by trickfishamps.com. You can use the code the base shed, the promo code the base shed for ten percent off. Check out what they're up to. Snoop around their cabinets. Snoop around the heads. Definitely, I highly recommend the minnow. Uh, go to trickfishamps.com again. Promo code the base shed for ten percent off. All right, I want to add a quick amendment to episode fifty-two. The last episode of the podcast, I had Matt Heyman on, and we talked about his book that is forthcoming forthcoming. First and foremost, I want to mention that the book is forthcoming. It is not published yet on Jimmy Blanton, uh, but I was really interested in all his research on Jimmy Blanton uh, and his backstory. Obviously, I'm I'm always interested in backstories, Um, but the book, the book that he's compiled on Jimmy Blanton is forthcoming. And the title uh, that I did reference is the title of his PhD. That is not the working title of the book either. I used that title in the podcast. You, you cannot look up that title and find Matt Heyman's book. I just want to throw that out there and make a public announcement about that. Um, you will still be able to find more information about it at MattHayman.com. My guest today is Anthony Crawford. I had a great time talking with Anthony. Uh, I had a great time talking with Anthony. Um, For someone who can play like that, 
right? I'm always interested to know their backstory and how that thing, uh, how they got that together. And he's going to talk about it. And it's very, he's so, um, what's the word? What's the word I'm, I'm trying to think of is he's kind of nonchalant about it. Like you hear him play and it's he's crushing it, crushing it. Um, yeah, and he's just so nonchalant about it. And he's he's going to talk about how he how he kind of got all that together. He's going to talk about his move uh, from Memphis. He's going to talk about how he got plugged in in Los Angeles. Uh, that it, it incorporated another high profile bass player, Brandon Brown. Um, yeah, I had an absolute absolute fantastic time uh, talking with Anthony. And here is my talk with bassist Anthony Crawford. How you doing? Doing all right. How you doing? Doing good, man. Cool. Where you at? You're in L.A.? Yeah, I'm in L.A. What about you? Yeah, L.A., down in Venice. Where you at? Uh, Hollywood. Okay. How long you been there? Oh, my God. Well, I've been in L.A. Uh, like probably 13 years now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, like 13 years. Uh, but oh. Hollywood. Yeah, how long uh, like Hollywood? A like a few months now. Oh, man. Okay. Where were you at before that? Uh, I lived all over Studio City, yeah. uh, uh, pretty much all over the Valley, uh, Woodland Hills, okay, uh, North Hollywood, just all over the Valley, actually. Yeah, I was up in NoHo Arts forever, like Magnolia and Lancashire. Like I was really? right up okay. there. Yeah, I mean, that's where I used to live. I, I, I had a few, uh, a couple of apartments out there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Killing, man. Killing. Uh, what have you been up to to stay busy during the pandemic? Oh my God, dude, since the pandemic, uh, well, I got fully vaccinated. Did good. That. Okay. <laughs> that's uh, good. That's, that's a good thing to do over the pandemic is get vaccinated. I mean, yeah. You know, pretty much not much you can do, but no. Than, you know, but I mean, since the pandemic, uh, of course, I've, I haven't been gigging, but I have been uh, doing a whole lot of production. Okay. And, and a lot of uh, writing. Yeah. So I've, uh, I did a few things uh, with like TV stuff. I've, I've, I've been doing uh, like trailer music for like movies. Okay. Um, just a lot, lot more production stuff. That's what I've been doing. Man, I remember when I heard that they had like special dudes writing for the trailers because I always thought they jacked excerpts from the film score. And mm-hmm. then, you know, and they would just cut it up. So it was like just an editing room thing when they did the trailers. But apparently they got their own. They got their yeah, own. Uh, the only thing that they cut up is the actual uh, footage. But the yeah. music, no, is the, the trailers have nothing to even do with the, the music composers. Oh, that's so on, crazy. On the movies or whatever is just totally different. That's a separate thing, actually. Yeah. You no, know, that's a whole separate thing. You know, um, the last trailer I did, uh, they won't even tell me the movie. Uh, they won't even tell me the name of the movie. <laughs> you know, they just no, seriously, they just um, that uh, this company I work with, they just sent me an email. It was yeah. literally during the pandemic. Okay. So, and I guess it was a movie that they, or whatever, some show, or whatever that they filmed before, yeah. but they was trying to bring it out. But I guess they just now bringing it out. But like, um, yeah, they just sent me an email and like, yo, man, we need a trailer for this, and. And, you know, that's how I get it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's just like a totally different thing. I don't even know the name of the movie. I don't know. Who <laughs> it. I don't know anything. Only thing I know is they hired me to literally write a trailer score. Yeah. I haven't even seen the video footage. They just wanted something specific. Wow. So what did you send you like, huh? they give you like a sound alike? They're like, yo, we want it to sound like yeah, this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like a little sound alike. They give me some type of guidance. Yeah, but I'm just saying, like, I don't even know what the name of the movie. Like, I don't even know anything about the movie, you know <laughs> like anything. So I don't even know what it, I don't know what that trailer is gonna go on. You know what I'm right. saying? Right. So I've done totally records different. like that that I have no idea like who the artist was or I don't know. I don't even know the names of the songs. Yeah. Like, I, like I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Like, I kind of yeah, remember you, the you session and that's just about do what it. Hard to do. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's it, man. Um, so let's, let's go back. Let's go back. You're originally from Memphis. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, and you you have a musical family. Your dad yeah. is drummer. Your brother, your uh-huh. uh, your uncle plays saxophone. Now, is that the uncle who's the brother of your dad? Are they on the same uh, side? Well, actually, it's, it's, I will say he's my great uncle. I'm not just calling him my uncle. He's the brother of my uh, granddad, actually. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Hank Crawford. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. cool. So yeah. then what being having all that music around, what was what were the records that were being played at the house? Man, my dad played everything. I was raised with my dad. OK. Um, and he played so much music, but the, the uh, he, I mean, he played everything from stacks. Yeah, stuff, a ton of that stuff that R and B, you know. Sure. You know, I mean, Otis you're Red. there. You're there. You're in Memphis. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, where yeah. it was Modern going down. Stuff, a lot of soul, but then I, he also was a, a rock drummer too. So okay. I don't know if you're familiar with like Eric Gales and all those people. No. Uh, he, it was a lot of rock and roll going on in the house. Okay. You know? uh, so, the music that I gra- gravitated towards first was like bands like. Metallica, King's X, Living oh, okay. Color, okay. Cool, yeah. Um, so progressive rock, more progressive on the. Prog- stuff, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't yeah. call Metallica progressive, but like Tool, King's yeah, X, I, yeah. I consider to be progressive. Yeah, progressive, yeah. like stuff like that. Uh, I mean, and I, I went through like, I mean, like eighties. Like I went through a phase where I was listening to like bands like Winger, Def Leppard. <laughs> okay. Uh, like, you know, just listening to all of that stuff that is what really made me gravitate towards music, like yeah. listening to that music. Okay. Interesting. Not the R&B, not the soul stuff. It was actually the rock stuff. Really? You want to play. Yeah. What, uh, what, what do you, if you can like go back to Now, how old are you at this time? I'm 39. No, no. Uh, when you started playing. Oh, when I started playing a bass, yeah. I was uh, 12. Okay. Pretty young. So at 12, it's like this aggressive rock, you know, it was the aggression. Probably, I'm yeah. assuming the energy of it that you really gravitated towards. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. That makes sense. To yeah, me. and the, uh, the energy, the vibe, is everything. I just like everything about it, man. Like, yeah, this is was very weird, man. And I still do <laughs> a lot of that stuff. So, yeah, do you? yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. Um, okay, so then you you started to play around 12. What what happens here? Are you getting into lessons? Were you just kind of learning from records that were around? Was your dad and your dad's friends showing you some things? Uh, you know, so funny, man. I, when I started to uh, play the bass, I asked my dad. I was, you know, I was like, how, how, you know, how do I learn? Like, how do I learn right. how to play the bass? And he just told me this simple thing, and I just used it. So all he told me was that, you know, if you want to teach yourself how to play the bass, he was like, just listen to records. Yeah. Listen, you know, find bass players that you like, and just do what they do. But just do it. Just do it your own way. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, and back then, like, I mean, I just had tapes and CDs and things like that. So that's what, how I literally learned how to play the bass. I would literally just get tapes and CD. I'll go to the record stores and just find all these albums that I, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and learn all of the music. Like yeah. I, I, I remember listening, uh, remember buying records. Yeah. Like, I mean, just all kinds of records, stuff that I was into, and I would literally put the CD on, and I would learn the, the whole entire CD. Okay. Like, note for note, like yeah. everything. Yeah. And then what that turned into was now I found myself jamming along with those bands. Like, yeah. I would put the records on, and it's like, okay, now I'm not even learning the music. I'm just kind of jamming. So I would literally just be in front of the radio, just playing and just having fun playing, because that's like I know the music. Right. Um, it freed you up. Yeah, it freed me yeah. up. And then, but subconsciously, I didn't know what was really going on. I was really teaching myself how to play because, and then I would keep going up. So it was like, I would learn a simple song. Yeah. And then I would get it. It would be hard at first. And then I just keep playing it until it gets simple and simple. Yeah. yeah. And then I just moved. And then I found a more complex song just like that. Then it just got to the point where I would literally be buying like Victor Wooten records. And I would <laughs> yeah. be learning. I would be learning every song, note for note. Like, all of that stuff. And then I would just keep playing it to the point where I can literally just play it behind my head. Yeah. yeah. And that's literally how I learned how to play the bass. Okay. <laughs> okay. So did you, at, at any point, did you get into formal training? Because we'll talk about it uh, a little later on. I mean, you play with some dudes that are, yeah, you know, so you play yeah. the fusion stuff, which is a heavy theoretical dude, you know, I'm gonna music. Tell you, man, I'm going to tell you, dude, my formal training was the radio. Like, I swear. Okay. Like, <laughs> okay. That was my formal training. Like, I never had lessons. Yeah. I never had a private instructor, teacher. I never had any, but I wanted those things. Yeah. And, and my dad told me, he was like, oh, yeah, uh, you know, I can get you a less of a trainer, whatever. Yeah. But he never did. I think my dad kind of saw that I was kind of doing it on my own. So he didn't even really feel the need to even right. do that. Right. 
you know. Yeah, I mean, and, you found something that works. Yeah, I just literally, even the people that I've played with and toured with, uh, ironically, a lot of those people were people that I grew up learning their music anyway. Okay. That's funny. So, yeah, so it's like, okay, yeah, I'm playing with this person, but oh, my God, I already know their music. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, right. yeah. You know, when I was 13. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, then at, at what point, uh, what were those early gigs then? When you started working professionally, what were some of your early gigs? So I started playing the bass at 12, and I started doing professional studio sessions at age 14. Okay. That's yeah. Uh, so at age fourteen, let me quick learn. Really quick. I'm, yeah, I'm in Hollywood. I'm shut this window. Uh, <laughs> yeah, helicopters all over the place. Yeah, yeah sure. but at age fourteen, I was already doing studio sessions, man. Uh, okay. So my dad would take me to the studio on things that he was working on. Yeah. Or some of his friends were working on certain things, and they would literally just hire me to play the bass on their music. Okay. And uh, I didn't. It, for me, I mean, you know what? I don't want to say to hire because I, I didn't even get paid, but it was one of those right, right, yeah. where I was in a professional setting. Like, I was l- literally getting prepared for the real world. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. I was in professional settings with producers and this, that, and the other. And, and, and a lot of times they'll be like, just play whatever you want to play. Okay. You know? And I will literally just pick up the bass and I hear the music. And, and, and I was already so accustomed to listening to the radio. Yeah. And just doing my thing. So I'm like, okay, now I'm in a studio and I'm literally doing the same thing that I've been doing in my bedroom. Right. But this time I'm just creating my own bass lines. Yeah. And it just made so much sense. It just all connected together. You know what I'm saying? So, right. It was, it's all the same thing. Like you're just playing along to what you hear this time. Yeah. They're just hitting record. Yeah. That's the only yeah, thing that's different. Thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what, what did you, what did you learn through that process? Now, when you're, when you're just playing along with the records and you're jamming out, if you play something that doesn't quite fix, oh, well, it already happened. You can't go back. You know, you yeah. you, you don't have the discretion. How did yeah. you, how did that come about? Because, like, I mean, when I was 14, I wasn't even playing yet. But those yeah. first couple of years, I didn't have any discretion. Yeah, 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 that's the thing. I didn't have any discretion as well. Uh, I just did whatever felt and sound good to me. Okay. Um, like, and they were all cool with it? Like, everybody, everybody in the studio is pretty cool? Yeah, I mean, as, I think at some points, I think I was overplaying because they would literally tell me to cut back some, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just wanted to play. Like, you know, you're young. It's like you just like you just want to play everything you've learned over the years. You know, what sure. I'm saying? like you just want to, you know, but my dad actually he used to tell me because uh, every four bars, I would be doing something like okay. I was doing something. Yeah. And then, and then my dad would, you know, because I was still immature in my playing. I had so many ideas, but I didn't know how to make it all make sense. Right, right, right. And uh, and my dad was telling me, he was like, yeah, you know, when you're playing, he was like, you don't want people to just uh, anticipate, like, when you're going to do something. Like, you know, you have to kind of throw it in, like, to make it mean more. Because if yeah. you're doing something every four bars, at some point, like, it's not going to mean anything. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. But yeah. me, at 14, hearing it, I'm like, oh, no, I'm going to play everything. <laughs> <laughs> Right. You know? right. right. Dad, listen to all these notes Wooten's playing. I can do that. I'm going to yeah. play all the notes, too. Yeah, I'm like, I've been in my room shedding this music all day. I want to play everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's cool, man. That's a that's a great age to get that experience. Yeah. Moving, um, when did you get into playing, like, nightclubs? And actually, when did it turn into a career? Uh, wow. When, I, when it turned to a career, I think I was, like, 17. Uh, okay. Right out of high school is when I started to hit the gig scene. Um, well, a little bit before high, uh, after I graduated, but right out of high school is when I really started to hit the gig scene um, and joined a couple of bands and started touring. Um, my first tour, ironically, was like L.A. Uh, flying out here from Memphis. That was a big thing for me. And just playing, doing things out here. And yeah, I say well, around 18 is when I started to hit the gig scene. I started playing uh, like nightclubs every, you know, five nights a week, started learning a lot of music, started, you know, doing these clubs where you have to play like 40 songs a night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Different artists. Uh, I was really like 18 years old. I was really holding it down, man. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah, like seriously, man. <laughs> that, that was back in Memphis? Yeah, that was back in Memphis. Okay, okay. Yeah. What was, uh, 
now when I think of Memphis, obviously I just think of like stacks and all that stuff. Yeah. What's what's the what's the scene like, or what was it like there? Live music? What was it? All the soul stuff that I assume yeah, it to be, or was music, it pretty eclectic? Yeah, l- the live music was pretty happening, depending on the style of music you were in. So, like you know, if you were into like a lot of, you know, out there type of music, you know, left field, Memphis probably would not have served you well. But like if right. you were into like blues, okay. R&B, gospel. Yeah, Dude, like it's cracking. Like uh, okay. back then when I was coming up, it was it, that was the place, man, because so much talent is in Memphis and come out of Memphis. Yeah. Amazing musicians, amazing singers. Like, sure. I mean, you know, a, a, a lot of a lot of talent came through Memphis and was actually brought up in Memphis. Uh, mm-hmm. So when I was coming up, I was around a ton of music, man. That's great. Of great, great musicians. All my friends were like crazy good musicians like it was just it was it was a great scene to be in yeah yeah yeah. i mean i know that there's like there's a whole little clique of memphis guys out here in la you know yeah, like yeah, memphis yeah. guys stay with and la's as you know la is very much like that like dudes that have come out from new york they all kind of huddle together like miami yeah. guys huddle together mm-hmm. Yeah, dudes that went to USC versus Calais. Like everybody has their own little group. Yeah, they have their own. We're in the scene. Yeah, and everybody that that I know that I've met that's from Memphis is always completely killing. Yeah, like yeah. I've never met anybody from Memphis. It's like, yeah, they're good, you know, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. everybody from Memphis is completely killing. Yeah, that that's. I mean, because we take it seriously out there. Like you know, it, it, the thing is, it's like it's it's it's, it's funny, man, because it's like. The people, when I was coming up, I mean, if you were a musician, you really had to be playing, man. Like, right. you had something to prove. You see yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah you got to be able like, to hang. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you have to be able to hang. Uh, and if you couldn't hang, it would be very obvious. And, you know, and, you know, you want to have as many friends and, <laughs> and until you get your stuff together. Like, seriously, right. like, it was like that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, that's get stuff together, man. Like, <laughs> you know, but I mean, coming up, it's like you want you want like you want to be like on top of your stuff. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Sure. It's like and and we all kind of brought that out here in L.A. because I noticed in L.A. when I came out here, I didn't think like there was anything special about me. Like, honestly, like I didn't. But but then it's like the more I play people were like dude like you have your own sound and blah 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 and i'm like really i have my own sound i'm like dude i'm just so used to doing this stuff every day right right to the point where like i don't think there's anything special about it but then coming from memphis everybody's killing out there yeah so it's like you know what it is it, 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 it's funny man it's a different dynamic man you know what i'm saying sure. but it was, a, it was a lot of practicing a lot of shedding a lot of what would you what did you think of the LA scene when you got to LA? Like, what was your first impression of the LA scene? Like, you go out to like the baked potato. How long have you been out here? Uh, thirteen years. Thirteen years. Okay, so there were still some clubs around. Lava Lee was still around. Yeah. Uh, Charlie O's was still around. Uh, maybe Spazio if you ever were into like the, the more straight ahead thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, but Lava Lee and the Potato were like the big kind yeah. of electric clubs. Yeah. So when you would go out there and you'd go hear these dudes at at either one of those spots, what do you think of the scene? Dude, like, I honestly felt at home, man. Like, dude, really? Because well, I'm going to tell you, man, when I when I came out here, right, and then let's say, like, I went to the baked potato. Yeah. And then I'm seeing all these guys playing, and I'm like, dude, like, they're, 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 they're not, uh, it's a little bit more eclectic. Like, they take more risks. They, they're more open. Like, it's more, you know, it's, because it's, in Memphis, it's kind of like, one thing or the other is like a lot of R&B, soul, gospel, little rock. Yeah. But pretty much it. Right. Unless you're doing your own thing. But L.A., when I came out here and I saw all the all of the, the, the creativity and like people like just playing all this style of music, stuff that I grew up listening to, mm-hmm. dude, I felt really at home. I'm like, dude, cool. like, I'm like, man, I want to play this stuff, man. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, because believe it or not, even in Memphis, at one point, I was kind of thinking about like not playing bass anymore and just doing something else, like literally changing careers. Really? Because yeah, you were because burnt out on, like you weren't inspired musically. I was inspired because, because, you know, I just saw myself doing the same thing over and over again, like, you know, sure. doing these clubs and, you know, um, it, you know, it just wasn't inspiring to me. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Right. And uh, one of my friends from Memphis, and it's so weird 
Uh, I don't think I've ever told anyone this, man, but uh, you know Brandon Brown? Basically? Yeah. I've met him a few times. Uh, I met him a few times, and I know, I think the last time I heard you play was at the Federal Bar. Remember that jam session? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. so me and Yaji started that session way back oh, okay. in the day. Yeah. yeah uh, so the last time I heard you play, I forgot why I was there, but Ben Williams was in town who plays with Pat Metheny. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And I think he was borrowing my bass and I came by to pick up my bass or something. I can't remember, but I remember running in to Ben there. And we then like, I looked up and it was you playing and then we were both just kind of like watching you and yeah. you, you were crushing it. Um, <laughs> but that was the last time I heard you play, but I, I met Brandon there. So to okay. rewind, like I met Brandon there and him and Kyle Bolden. I played once yeah, with Kyle. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I met all those guys through that jam session. Man, I'm gonna tell you, man, Brandon. Uh, I gave Brandon his first bass amp, man. <laughs> his first bass amp. I gave him his first bass amp because, <laughs> because when he first started to play the bass, like he didn't even have an amp, so I literally gave him an amp. Okay. You know what was it? And uh, so we've been tight. We, me and Brandon, have been you know we've been cool for a long time, man. Yeah. Um, so he came out here in 2007. I okay. Came out here in 2008. Okay. So, uh, so he came out here in 2007, um, and so I was still in Memphis. So, and I remember one of my friends um, invited me to some random party in Memphis, mm-hmm. and he was like, "Yo, man, come to this party." And, and I remember it was like late at night. I was like, "Oh, cool, I'll go." But I didn't know Brandon w- was back in town. Brandon was in Memphis on that okay. night, and he came to their, their random party, right? Yeah. And so, man, Brandon started talking. And he was like, yeah, I was like, dude, how's it going out there? You know, in LA and stuff, man. He was like, man, it's going good. And he said, other. And then, um, and but then he was talking to me. I was like, yo, man, I was like, dude, I think I'm, I'm, you know, I'm about to get ready to just focus on something else. I'm, like, dude, I'm getting burnt out playing bass, man. Yeah. And then he was like, shocked. He was like, what? I was <laughs> like, dude. No, I was like, man, I'm like, dude, like, you know, it's just, you know, I just ain't inspired. Like, I, yeah. I'm just burnt out, you know? I, yeah. I, I don't know what it is. I'm just, and I was like, dude, I'm just going to, because I was about to get ready to start some marketing business venture i was about to start doing like network marketing and stuff like that okay. like i was literally preparing to switch careers you see what i'm saying oh were you actually interested in that or you're just like yeah this is a cool gig and like i can make some money and just yeah yeah i, yeah. Was, I was open to literally just try things out outside of music you see what yeah because i've always just done music but then it was like i was just to the point where i would just kind of just burnt out playing you know right uh around town and stuff and um so and he was like, and then me and him, you know, he really talked to me, man. He was like, yo, man, he was like, dude, he was like, don't stop playing. He was like, playing the bass, that's like your gift and this and the other. He yeah. had a hard to hard talk with me. Okay. You know? Okay. And then uh, and then he was like, he was like, yo, you know what? I'm gonna tell you what. He was like, dude, come to LA, you know, you can sleep on my couch or whatever, man. And uh, and then dude, like just try it out. So okay. that's the reason why I came to LA because Brandon oh, met crazy. Me his, yeah, he met me at that party. And uh, uh, this random, I didn't even know he was in town. He just yeah, came to right. the party like randomly and just yeah. like saw me there and then just and co- literally convinced me to move out here. Okay. And then, so yeah. how long from that party until you were in LA? How long, how long in between? Oh my God. Maybe like a few months. Okay. So that was in 2007. I yeah. came out here New Year's Day, 2008. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So 2008, I left Memphis New Year's Day. And I came, my point, I came out here January the second, two thousand eight. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And can I, I drove out here. Yeah. From Memphis. It took me two days. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't. Yeah. Did you? Uh, that's pretty. That's pretty good. You didn't like stop and see sights. Go cross no, country in two going. days. You're like going. plowing yeah. through. Yeah. yeah. I just kept going, man. <laughs> uh, so yeah. cool. You're out here. You you know Brandon. You're sleeping on Brandon's couch. Yeah, I slept on this couch for like three months, man. But that's a great dude to like introduce you to the scene because like I don't yeah. I think by the time I met him, he was already playing with Stevie. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Like, I don't know when he got that gig, but uh, I think I met him in maybe I don't know twenty twelve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like all over the place. That dude is playing with everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's got his own. Last I heard, he had his own thing. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. If, I don't know what's going on with that anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean, so you what are you doing? You going out to jams with Brandon, the Cafe Cordial, like stuff like that? Yeah, Cozy's we to, Cozy's uh, was around then. Yeah, Cozy's. That's what I, that that right there was our spot, Cozy's. Okay. Uh, and it, and actually, uh the night that I got out here, he took me to Cozy's the same night okay. I got out here. Cool. And uh and then that's when I started meeting everybody, and you know, uh Gouche would be coming down there hanging out, all these 
musicians and yeah you know it would be so weird because these musicians would be uh you know like the cats you know what i'm saying and then they yeah, all be in this little hole in the wall place <laughs> yeah. especially cozy he's like just an old old dingy uh yeah. but that's just like what those old hangs in the valley were like i feel like yeah. like everybody was just out and they're just yeah. hanging and it was great yeah 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 that was that was crazy i'm like dude like all these cats man just like just doing all this stuff man they just literally just at this little place yeah it's like you know, just hanging, man. I was like, dude, now I was, that's how I met like Ethan Farmer and okay, like all, all the guys, man, they were just there. And that's how I started meeting a lot of people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But so then, so what were some of the first gigs you picked up in LA? Uh, the first gig that I did in LA. Oh my God. Oh, Jesus, let me think. <laughs> let, me think of this. <laughs> let me think of this. I think my first gig I did in L.A. probably was Cozy's. <coughs> okay, the house band? Uh, yeah, because I was hanging out there so much, and I think uh, they uh, – and I was playing, and they was like, oh, so they, they got me to play it one night. Yeah. Uh, but, like, my first steady gig in L.A. was uh, the comedy store uh, in oh. um, Sunset. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I was playing there like every Tuesday night. And how I got that gig was Tim Bailey, the bass player that was playing at Cozy, just recommended me. Okay. And uh, I didn't even know they uh, had music. Yeah, they, it was in between the comedy skits. Oh, there's a band. Yeah, that was like a band to play in between like the, the, the comedians, but when I walked up stage. Oh, yeah. And we did that probably a year. And that was a cool little gig because that was my first gig. Um, that was my first gig that I had that was like on a steady basis. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, you know, so it was just a little thing that was kind of like kind of getting me off the ground. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know, so. And then then how did things snowball? So you who who else was in the uh, comedy store band? Oh, it was this drummer. His name was Ray. Uh, and they had different piano players. Lance, uh, uh, Lance Tolbert. Okay. Uh, you might know him. Um, he's a bass player. He plays with like a lot of people, and he was the piano player, mm-hmm. pretty much. And then I was the bass player. And then they had this one uh, guitar player. His name was Mike. Okay. Um, this was years ago, man. Uh, but yeah, but I mean, speaking of musicians, Lance. Um, I mean, I was playing with him at the comedy store years ago, and now when I see him, I mean, this guy is like producing Mariah Carey records and all kinds of oh, stuff. Oh, man. Okay. Like he, he's like, he's like, I'm, I mean, I'm really proud of that guy, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm like, remember us logging yeah. out of equipment <laughs> to the comedy store? <laughs> right. Playing. And then now, like, when I talk to him, like, this guy is, like, doing all kinds of stuff now, man. Oh, like, that's cool. It's, it's the real, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, that's so. cool. Yeah, man. So. Uh, how long did that get last? They get, they get last maybe like a year. Okay. We'll say. Okay, that's pretty Maybe strong. Like year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How'd you get into? Uh, how'd you get into? I think I remember. I first heard of you. I think with Virgil. Uh huh. Virgil. Yeah, and um, and then uh, then I I know you know him too. You know Mahesh Balasuria. Yeah. 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 So he, me, and Mahesh used to play a lot together, and he. I remember when he told me that he got Holdsworth. And then he actually invited me to come down to that last gig of Holdsworth. I think it was in San Diego. Okay. Like, dude, you got to come down, man. Like, you know, come hang. I'm like, all right, I got nothing going on. Maybe I'll come down. Uh, And I didn't. And then it turns out to be Holdsworth's last gig. That sucked. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Yeah. 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 Uh, How'd you get into that? See, coming from like the cozy scene, which is uh, for people, I guess, not in L.A. That was like the like the R&B gospel. Yeah road guy hang mm-hmm. uh and so that is kind of drastically different than virgil donati and alan holtz yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well that's the thing about me man i'm i'm th- not th- for th- you th- like i understand it from you because that's the stuff you were listening to growing up so cool but how did you get into the uh, that you know those artists virgil and alan holdsworth when you're hanging with like goucher and ethan farmer Man, you know, in the R and B world, man. like how how did you cross that bridge in the Dude, LA that's world? That's a good question, man. That's a good question. Like the thing is, I've always been a versatile 
musician. Like I've yeah. always played so much music. And it's so funny that one of my first hangs was like a gospel R&B hang, but that's that right there really really wasn't the music that started me off with bass. Okay. You know, like I told you, the stuff that got me really into what I'm doing is that progressive stuff. You sure. You see what I'm saying? Sure. So, um, some, I was talking with somebody. Uh, I was talking with some of the cozy guys, right? Okay. And I was I was going through a period where I was like, oh my God, like, you know, um, like, it's kind of, you know, it's hard to like, you know, find some gigs out here. Yeah. So I was going through that little stage where I was getting a little discouraged, whatever. And then, um, so a few people came to me, right? And they told me, and it was on some political stuff, like some real like political stuff, man. There was like, Anthony, um, the reason why no one really wants to hire you for a gig, and they literally told me this, and a few people told me this. They were like, uh, you're just too good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and I tell you, I tell you people that told me that. <sighs> Ethan Farmer told me that. Ethan um, told you Really? Because Ethan Ethan's that. killing. Like, yeah, Ethan told me that. Uh some of J Lo's camp, they told me that. Like a lot okay. of they they told they all told me that they was like, Anthony, man, you 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 you're too good. People will be intimidated by you, right? And then so I'm thinking to myself, like, dude, but I know how to play music. Like, right. you know, I know how to play a song. Like, I yeah. don't get up there and kill everything I do. Yeah. And and they were like, they, they was like, still, like, you're just too good. Like, you you can't, like, people are not going to want to hire you. So pretty much they were trying so to So they thought you were going to really- do that, that thing? Like, if you were on, let's say if you were on J-Lo's gig, like, yeah. they just assumed you were going to do that all the time? Like, with all the chops and the thing, Dude, like uh, they didn't think no you were idea. just gonna play music. I, I don't know what they thought I was gonna do, uh-huh. but but for some reason, every time I went to a jam session, and this happened a lot too. Every time I went to a jam session, every time I did something like that, this is what would happen every single time. The band would play, right? And I played a part, like I played a song. Yeah. And whenever it's time for me to solo, you know what happens? Everybody walks off stage. <laughs> that happened all the time. And one time, <laughs> I was at Cozy's, right? Yeah. I was playing, and I'm just caught up in my world. I'm just doing whatever I'm doing. I look around. Nobody's on stage with me. Everybody just walked off. Everybody's in the audience looking. And you know what happens when I got done playing my solo? Cozy's, they closed. <laughs> they closed. That was like, well, nobody else wants to play. So we're just going to close. <laughs> what time of night? Was this at like 10 o'clock? Was it still kind of early? Yeah, it was early. Like it was still supposed to be going. But nobody <laughs> else wanted to get on stage and play after me. No, ain't you, nobody. You literally, literally shut it down. You yeah, literally yeah. shut it down. And that has happened a couple of times, right? Yeah. So people would see that <laughs> and they don't be like, oh my God, he can play. But I don't know if he can play an R&B gig. Right, right. right? Yeah. So see, LA is funny like that. Whatever they see you doing... Mm-hmm. Or like if that's the first time they heard you or saw you, that's all you do all the time. Yeah. Like yeah. LA is yeah. super quick to pigeonhole people into however they met you, that's the only thing you do. So if they yeah. only heard you solo, you all you do is solo. Yeah, all you do is solo. But yeah, they, that's it. You know, they don't have no other idea of all this. Other yeah, stuff, exactly. You know, exactly. You know, um, so this is what I got from that when people were telling me that. Like I said, a lot of the cats, like the main A-list musicians were telling me the same thing. Okay. I was like, it sounds like that they're literally trying to get me to dumb myself down. Like, you know, like really dumb myself down so I can kind of fit in. Right. And that's what I got from them. So instead of me falling in that little circle of like, oh, I got to fit in. So let me dumb myself kind of stuff, which I don't do. So I said to myself, you know what? I'm just going to create my own gigs. I'm going to do my own stuff. Cool. And and so I started putting out my own records. I started okay. doing my own YouTube videos. I started doing my own thing. Uh, speaking of which, off the subject, uh, I have to redo my website again because that uh, closed and I forgot to renew it. So I'm going to get that back going. But it got, <laughs> to <a> point, <laughs> it got to a point where I started to really uh, establish an online presence. Like on yeah, YouTube, yeah. Okay. I was doing, I was doing lessons, uh, virtual lessons. Like, I was doing this stuff back in the day. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
I was, uh, what else was I doing? Uh, I got my web, and a lot of musicians didn't even have a simple website back then, too. No. I was, yeah, when I, when, when people found out, it was like a big deal, too. Yeah. Uh, I had Are you pretty tech kids. savvy? Are you pretty cool with all that? You Like, you know no, about. I just, I know a lot of tech savvy people. I don't have. Okay. I don't <laughs> I, That's the like, ultimate seriously? tech savvy. That's the most savvy you can be is delegated. Dude, I, I'm going to tell you, man, like, I'm going to tell you. I, I think I'm a pretty smart person. Yeah. Because. If I, I know if I can't do something, I'm not going to try to do it. Simple sure. as that. Right. I'd rather hire someone to do something that I know for a fact I can't do. So that way there's no headaches. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and just be done with it. Right. 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 Um, right. I started investing into my career, investing to myself. I started marketing myself. I started taking out Google ads, Google, uh, uh all kinds of advertisements, you know, advertising okay. my records. Uh, I started doing pandora this is when pandora literally just now hit the like just started coming out oh wow i was doing all of this stuff with my music and what happened was i i got an idea like dang like youtube and things like this i i said to myself like this is literally a way for me to audition for anything i want to audition for i can send this to anybody i want to send it to yeah i can literally just do anything i want to do well literally without even being there so yeah. And I've got major gigs from YouTube, like literally like Erica Badu, like Jeff Lorber, like all these guys <laughs> hit me up. They hit me up from YouTube. And I remember when did, what years did ago, you play with Badu? Huh? What years did you play with Badu? 2012. It's on okay. YouTube. Okay. And I remember specifically telling people when I first came to LA and I felt all this stuff out, I was like, dude, if you're not on YouTube, I don't know what you're doing. Like, yeah. dude, get on YouTube. People was not trying to hear that stuff, man. Yeah. Because they were so used to doing it their way. And I can tell you somebody else, too. Um, a real famous bass player. I'm not going to even say his name, but he's a famous bass player. Okay. He made a comment one time. This was a few years ago. He was like, a musician that's on YouTube is not really considered like a real musician, right? Oh, man. Somebody chimed in. I had nothing to do with this conversation. He was just some arrogant like bass player. Yeah. Someone chimed in and said... And they tagged me. They said, what about Anthony Crawford? Oh, okay. Okay. And then, you know what he said? He said, that's an exception. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, got gonna pass. Say his name. you got to pass. Say, huh? yeah. You got to pass. You got a free pass. You, you, yeah, you I'm not going to say his name because okay. I know you know him. Okay. But I'm just letting you know that that's the kind of mindset I had when people started telling me to dumb myself down. Really, what I did, I amped it up more. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. So, Fast forward, that's how Virgil found me, YouTube. Oh, on YouTube. Okay. He okay. saw my videos. Yeah. And Virgil doesn't know this, but I remember meeting him years ago at, okay. at a gig he did. And I walked up to him because I was a fan of him before I even like started working with him. Yeah. I walked up to Virgil. I said, Virgil, I was like, I would like to work with you one day. He was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but he doesn't remember that. He doesn't yeah. remember that. Now right. me and him are friends now. But he I think I think me. the first time I met you was at a Virgil gig because I, I knew the promoter. I forgot what year this was. This must have been, what are we in now, 21? Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe uh, 2013 maybe. This was mm -hmm. kind of a while. And you guys had just finished the tour, and the tour was ending at King King in Hollywood. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the promoter asked me, he's like, yo, you want to bring your band in and open for Virgil? I'm like, if it works, cool, I'm down. Yeah. And so, like, whatever, he did the posters up and, you know, like, my band was cool and we were ready. Actually, Mahesh was on that. Mahesh was going to do it. With me. Uh -huh. um, he was in my band. And then for some reason, something happened that I, don't know, I got a call at like two o'clock or something. Uh, we were getting Thai food after the rehearsal. And the promoter calls me. He's like, yo, man, there's something with Virgil's kit, I think. And he was like concerned about it or it was going to take more time. It was some setup thing. I can't remember. But I still went out to the gig and I met Virgil there. And, you know, it was cool to meet him. And I think I, I'm pretty sure I met you there. That was the first time I met you. OK. I have no idea if that was the year. I know it was at King King. Yeah, I remember King King. I remember that gig. OK. I don't know if you guys have played there more than once, but that was I think I was. Holdsworth was there with playing with you guys. Okay, maybe this is another gig because Holdsworth didn't play with us. Uh, no, or maybe I saw Holdsworth another night. Maybe Holdsworth. I know I saw Holdsworth there too. I can't remember if he was playing with Virgil or okay. if it was like a Holdsworth thing. I don't know. 
Okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. I remember King King. King King, uh, I remember that gig. Yeah. That was a cool gig, man. Uh, that was a cool gig. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's how, that's literally how I got his gig, man, literally through YouTube. He saw, yeah. he saw the stuff that I was doing and he just emailed me. He was like, and I've, you know, this happened time and time again. Like, just artists would just email me. Yeah. Because of YouTube. Okay. And, you know, they were like, you know, we, you know, I like what you do or whatever, you know, and then, you know, and then I started working with them, you know? Great. Um, now, when you when you were cutting the YouTube videos, were you thinking audition tape? Is that what you were cutting? Or were you just like no, I was playing around in your room and you're like, yeah, I'm going to record this and then just put yeah. it out there? Yeah, I'm just gonna like, I have so many videos with me literally just in my room just playing. Yeah. Like, and I'm like, you know what? This sounds cool. I'm just going to put it on YouTube. Like, okay. whatever. Yeah. Uh, because I was looking at YouTube more so like, um, okay, like a relationship. Like, the people that follow me, yeah. I want them to kind of see me literally in my pajamas right. just messing around on the base. Like, like a real-life look at, yeah, at yeah. what's up. Like, yeah. Like, they, they're, they're getting to know me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Okay. That's and a cool it's approach. Not all, it's not all... Uh, smoking mirrors every time. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So I have a lot of those videos, man. I have some videos of me talking okay. in the camera and it's so bootleg. Like, <laughs> half, half of my head is cut off. Got the whole video. Like, my, like I think the, the camera only shows, like, my nose or something. <laughs> That's how bootleg it was. But, dude, people appreciate stuff like that, though. Yeah. I think yeah, it's like the camera's literally cutting off half of my head. Yeah. <laughs> they don't and I care. uploaded it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't think production value is what they're concerned with. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're just, they're like, just oh there my for God, some content. This is a real dude. This yeah. Is a real guy. <laughs> right. 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 Um, at what point did you get into writing and doing production and writing for trailers? Like, how long... And how did you get into that from... I mean, like you've already kind of reinvented your time in L.A. here a few times. You, you're yeah. hanging at Cozy's. You're doing the gospel R&B scene. You're hanging with those dudes. Then you get into like the progressive jazz rock, you know. Mm. I mean, yeah, it's fusion, uh, mm. both fusion. You get into the fusion thing and then then you're writing. So these are yeah. all like three definite career, like separate, mm. separate yeah. worlds. Man, I'm going to tell you, man, if I can go back in time, <laughs> in 2006 is when I first started producing. If I can go back okay. in time and say, Anthony, take this seriously, I would have yeah. done it. Okay. Because here's the thing. Um, I kind of got into producing kind of a little bit by accident. I just so happened to be over one of my friend's house. He had reason, this program reason. Yeah, yeah. I remember hearing And him. he was showing me on his computer. He's like, yo, man, like, Dude, I was like, man, you're making this on the computer? Yeah. He was like, yeah. Because I'm thinking, I'm coming from old school. I'm thinking, like, in order for you to make music, you need to be in front of a console. Right, right. You need to be in a studio. Right. You got to book out the studio. You got to have the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, because that's what I'm used to. Right. And then and, and he made some tracks on in on his computer. I'm like, dude, this stuff sounds amazing. Yeah. I'm like, dude, show me how to do this. So I went and got a computer. Uh, he gave me like a cracked version of Reason or something like that. I got like a little MIDI keyboard and I just started doing tracks, uh -huh. beats, and just started making music just for fun. Like, yeah. it was just the fact that like I can literally just sit at home and just make a song out of nothing and then I can listen to it and it's like I enjoyed it. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. Never, I never took it seriously though. Okay. I just did it just for fun. Like, I would literally make a, a track, like, every few months. I would sit in front of my computer and get make a beat. And then, yeah. like, three months later, I might, I might not do anything. Right. But fast forward, now, like, a couple of years ago, when I started to get, like, serious about that stuff, and I, and I literally felt myself doing the exact same thing that I was doing back in 2006, and I'm like, dude, I could have just kept this going, and it could have been so much more going on right now with me. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It's like I, I always did it as a hobby, but now within a couple of years, a couple of years uh, today, like I've been taking it more seriously. Okay, like making it making more of a business out of it, like working every day, uh, right. networking with uh, music supervisors, music licensing companies, uh, 
investing and in going into seminars, talking with decision makers, uh, hitting up, they're like treating more like a business. You know yeah, it's a, it's a hustle. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's a never ending hustle. And how right. I got that trailer was because a couple of years ago, I was at some seminar that I paid to go to okay. uh, just to meet people. Yeah. Literally just to meet people. Right. But the people that I was meeting were the people that you want to meet if you're in that world. You know what I'm saying? Right. And like, and I met one of the, the owners of this company and this was back in 2017 ish, something like that. And like I said, this is 2021. And he literally just hit me up randomly. Like, I don't know, three, four years later. Yeah. We made that deal happen. You see okay. So sometimes stuff has, has to develop, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 That's cool. What what was yeah. the what was the nature of the music? What kind of what kind of music? What kind of themes did you? It's did, more like sound design, electronica. Epic. Like just a lot of okay, epic like kind of sound bed stuff. Yeah, epic. But like when you listen to it, it's like it has like, um, it's like an action thing. You know okay. What I'm yeah. It's like an action. Like okay. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty yeah. percussive. Yeah, definitely a lot of percussion, a lot of like sense and sound design, a lot of epicness and wishes and booms and all that. You know? <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I feel like and, it's and since I, Game of Thrones, man. I'm just hearing cello and everything now, dude. I'm a I, you, and man. I think it, I think it's because of Game of Thrones. Yeah, it, like sometimes when something kicks off, and I notice this, a lot of stuff is trendy. So yeah. when something is like popular, especially in the TV world, when once they find that one thing is popular, everybody wants it. Right, everybody's on the cello now. Yeah, everybody yeah. wants it. Do you use any cello on the track? Oh my god, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Love it. All the time. Love dude, it. Dude, I'm gonna tell you, man, like, dude, I'm not I'm look, 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 I'm a bass player, but at the same time, like, Dude, I'm a businessman too. Like, I'm sure. like, okay, if this is what they want, hey, you got it. <laughs> yeah, that's the gig. That's the gig. So you got to do yeah. it. You got to do it. Um, how many records do you have out under your own name? Uh, under my own name, uh, three records. Three records. Um, I have a live record that's in the mix of uh, being mixed. And then I have another record that's in the middle of being mixed as well. I have Robert Glasper's uh, people doing the mixing for that stuff because oh, I dope. like yeah 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 dope. and I have a live record too that uh that I recorded that I mean I need to just focus on getting that mix that I can literally just put that out as well man so tell me tell me about the records what uh where was the live record recorded the live record was recorded at a concert in Pasadena at the Rose at the Rose um the Rose Bowl uh, yeah not the Rose Bowl it's like the Rose uh it's a concert hall it's called the Rose oh, okay yeah, 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 yeah. So we did that. Um, I who's uh, who's on it? Who's in the band? Uh, you know, Gertigo uh, Burley. Uh, no of him, no of him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, that dude is a machine, dude. Yeah. That, I mean, that dude is a machine. He's one of my favorite drummers. But like, he's on it. Uh, and I have a couple of my friends. You might not know him. But one guy named his name is Mark Rodriguez. Uh, okay. Playing guitar, amazing guitars. And then uh, I have another friend. Uh, we call him John John on keys. Okay, uh, and these are like just really good friends I've just known throughout the years since I've been in LA, man. You know. Yeah. What uh, yeah. what kind of stuff is it? Progressive metal. Uh, this is my my style of music. I call it urban jazz. Okay, urban so, jazz. Yeah. So like, uh, it's like a mixture of jazz with like hip hop. Okay, flavor. so like kind of on the the Glasper, Kamasi, yeah. Thundercat. Yeah, a little a little of that. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, the studio record that I'm going to release uh, is really, it's like Robert Glasper meets Yellow Jackets. Everything okay. is organic. I mean, like live, you know, like we record it all together in the same room. Yeah. Like uh, real, like Yamaha C7 piano, real Fender Rose, bass. Okay. Stuff. Like we're all playing how they used to do it back in the day, like in the same room, just playing. Right. Right now, you is know? that is that the same band? Is this your band? Is this, are no, those this is, the guys? This is this is okay. my stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, are, is it the same personnel as the live record? Oh, no, the live record, totally different. Okay. Because I went a different direction. Okay. With, with this next, the live record was, uh, I wanted a certain sound, but this record, uh, I wanted another certain sound. And yeah. The people that I called specifics for this were the people I know that can do it, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Like, who's so, on that one? 
Uh, so I got uh, this guy. His name is Lance Lucas uh, on uh, Keys. He's, okay. his, uh, he's one of my friends from Memphis. And I have another, you know, Frank Fluker, drummer? You hear, you hear to him? No. What's his he, last name? Frank Fluker. So you, are no. you hip to Frank McCone? No. There's, there's, okay, a, there's okay. a whole... Yeah. There's a um, whole scene out there. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what's weird about L.A. It's like you and I will know so many of the same people. And then, like, you'll tell me some names like no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, Frank Fluker uh, is another drummer friend of mine from Memphis. They also okay. lives in L.A. OK. Uh, and Lance uh, lives in Nashville, but he's from Memphis as well. And uh, everybody else, that was the core of everything. Just us. OK. OK. You know, and everything else, we just kind of just, you know, I just hired out, you know, edit things like that. But the core of everything was literally us in the studio. Recording. Okay. Okay. You know, you know. So now when you, when you go in and you like, you have ideas, do you let them work out their own part? Do you write stuff out for them and be like, yo, I specifically want this, but everything else you can do whatever you want to. That's the thing. I never write nothing out, man. I okay. never write things out, man. Like if I'm collaborating with people, I want them to bring their thing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. You know, um, I mean, that's the freedom you had going all the way back to when you were 14. It's yeah, like I they want them would... to just do their thing. Like, I mean, of course, if I have certain things that I want done, they can do it. But not, a lot of times when I'm set on certain things and then I, I, then I just let people do what they're going to do, it, right. it just comes out better to me. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I would never have thought about that. You know? Yeah, yeah, right. They They think, I mean... They think like that, like drummers think like drummers. And so yeah, like they're yeah. going to come up some, with something better than I could or like, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. I agree with you. I just let them do their thing because they know it better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, back around 2015, this metal band hit me up. Uh, they, they just put the, they, they just got together and everything. And uh, their engineer emailed me, Cole emailed me from, from YouTube, of course. Yeah. And he was like, um, you know, I got these guys in the studio and this, that, and the other, and uh, we saw your videos, and, you know, we would like to get you to, to, to do their record, right? And so I said, like, okay, send me a song, and then I'll, I'll record it, and then uh, see see how they like it, whatever. And so uh, they sent me a song, and when I heard it, it's like a cross between, like, stream theater, Yngwie Malmsteen, like, that type of metal. Okay. So progressive. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I grew up on this stuff. I already know what they're trying to do. So yeah. I recorded, <laughs> yeah, I recorded the bass line, and they loved it, right? And they were like, oh, my God, can you do the record? I'm like, yeah. cool, yeah, sure. So they sent me the record. And on top of that, they sent me charts, right? Okay. And then I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I, I was like, do you want me to, like... I know where you're going with this, yeah. I can, I can like, already I can tell like, where you're going with this, yeah. I was like, you know, I was like, you know what? I just lied to them. I was like, look, you know what? I can't read. I'm just going to play what I want to play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, huh? I said, I said, trust me. I'm just going to play whatever I want to play. Just trust me on this. Yeah. And I'm like, because, like, you're a good time player trying to write bass lines. I, can, I already know this is going to sound whack. Like, I just know. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I, I know it's going to sound whack. I've had... I've been through this plenty, plenty of times. Sure. Good top players trying to write bass lines. It doesn't work. I'm sorry. Right. right. <laughs> Let right. me handle the bass part. <laughs> so fast forward, I did the record. <coughs> uh, and they love the record. Uh, apparently other people love the record. And they got signed with Sony and everything. And they just freaking took off. Okay, cool. Yeah, man. So like, what was the name of the band? Oh, uh, Weatherfall. Weatherfall? Yeah, Weatherfall. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they didn't ask you to do any of the road dates or anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm still working with them and stuff. Oh, like you still work so with them? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we literally before the COVID, we we did Europe and all this stuff. Like we did we did a lot of tours and already. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. You know, so, but I mean, but that was the beginning of it. They had to like literally trust me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> do my thing, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How did it? Was that was that an easy conversation when you told them like, yo, I'm just gonna do my own thing? Were they cool? Or were they no, like, it was yeah, cool. but. Okay. No, it was cool. They were hesitant, but I yeah, was like, yeah. "Look, just trust me. Just trust me on this. Right. If you don't like it, you don't have to use it. But trust me. Let me just let me just do the bass. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, how many like right before COVID ended? So you're working with Virgil still. Uh huh. You're working with that band. Who else are you working with? Oh uh, my God. Um. Wow, that's a good question. Who was? I mean, I was, <laughs> well, who was, I was really working a lot with Wilberfall, that band, because um. Uh, like I said, they were starting to tour a lot. They still do have stuff booked, but it's, you know, depending on the conditions. But sure. I was starting to work with that band a whole lot, of course, with Virgil. Um, and I was doing a lot of 
I was getting into a lot of doing a lot of session stuff. Um, and I was doing a lot of stuff around town as well. Mm-hmm. Like oh. just, you know, baked potato and stuff like that. Sure. A lot of gigs. So. Sure. Who are you at with the, the potato? Um, uh, well, the potato, I was, I, I mean, it's always know, a pickup uh, band at the potato, but yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the baked potato, I was playing a lot with, uh, you know, Alex, uh, Mahakachik. Yeah. Yeah. Him, um, me and Gurgle Burl, I was doing a lot of stuff there. Uh, I was playing just a lot, just with just random people, man. You know okay. what I'm saying? Like, yeah, whoever whoever will call, I'm available. You know? Right, right, right. That's, um, that, I feel like that's how yeah. the potato. That's how the potato works. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like they just opened back up. What, like a week or so ago? Oh my god, dude! They are. They're, they're finally. They are, I'm surprised. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm glad that they're back, but. Uh, yeah, they just opened, and I was going to go down there to show some support on, I think it was a Sunday, mm-hmm. um, that they opened back up, and I just, you know. I mean, you know how it goes with the baked potato. There's always somebody amazing playing there, more often yeah. than not. But you, you take it for granted after a certain point. Like, ah, eh, whatever. I'll yeah. catch them next time. Oh, you know? <laughs> Where, yeah, whereas, like, you know, you get spoiled. <laughs> you get spoiled by them always just being there. I mean, my, yeah, my favorite gig at the baked potato is one of okay? I have a couple. One of them was with, of course, Alan Holbert. Uh-huh. Sure. But another gig, I actually, I was playing with uh, with um, Gary Willis. You hear the Gary? Oh yeah, 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 man. Like uh, me and Gary, uh, it was around now, so we did a couple of gigs. But we did the bass potato too. Okay. Like, I was playing like we were both playing with we two bass players. Right, right. Who's yeah, the drummer? Gertico Barla. He was playing drums. Okay, okay. Yeah. And just the just the two of you? It was me and you know Eddie Brown. Yeah. Yeah. Eddie Brown, Miracle Burley, uh, me on bass, and Gary Willis on bass. <laughs> That's a yeah, dude. <laughs> he's yeah, in Spain and, now, isn't he? Gary Willis. Yeah, yeah, he's teaching yeah. out there, dude. Like, I, I'm not gonna lie, man. Like, I, I really get starstruck, man. But dude, I could not believe that I was on stage playing with that dude. Man. That's pretty crazy. That's pretty crazy. I'm like, this is okay, dude. Do you know who you are? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, dude. Like, dude. I don't think you really know who you are, Gary. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you must, I mean, coming from that, the progressive thing that you came from, you must have loved those early tribal tech Dude, records. like, that's the stuff I was growing up on. Yeah. Like, I was, I still do listen to that stuff. Like, tribal tech, like, even their early stuff, like, even their first records, I'm like, dude, that was just awesome different stuff, man. Yeah, yeah. Like, and then, and it's like, I'm listening, and I remember listening, studying Gary and, like, just being amazing, like just guys, amazing fretless player, amazing soloist, so knowledgeable, and so like his groove. He, he got one of he got one of the heaviest grooves, man. Like his groove yeah. is just nuts. Mm-hmm. But then he can solo his butt off, like yeah, crazy, yeah. And like I just don't know many bass players that can do that stuff, man. Right to go from both sides, uh, yeah, yeah, without either. Without like the bass, the groove part doesn't suffer, and the solos don't yeah, suffer. Yeah, yeah. Like it both is. excel. Yeah, and he's so knowledgeable. Like, I mean, his harmonies and like all that stuff. And then it's like, this dude hit me up to play with him. Like, dude, come on now. Oh, man. is that how? It, was that a YouTube situation? Did he hit you up on yeah. YouTube? Yeah. <laughs> dude, I'm gonna love you, it, love it. I'm gonna tell you, dude. YouTube is this been my get. This been my audition tapes, man. Okay. Listen, you still doing it? You still you still I, still, I don't YouTube do it stuff? as much as I used to, but I still do do it. Okay. Okay. I don't do it as much. Yeah. Uh, but because I'm, I'm focused on others, I'm focused on <laughs> trailers. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing movie trailers that you don't even yeah. know the movie. <laughs> I mean, no, the movie. I'll let you know when it comes out. Man. Yeah, yeah, do, do. Uh, what do you got? What do you got coming up the rest of 21? You got some uh, gigs opening back up and some tours coming back for you? Uh, well, so far, Willowfall has something has something at the end of the year in Europe. So okay. Far. Cool. Uh, but that's, you know, up in the air, of course. Uh, but that's pretty much it. I plan on releasing and finishing up my, at least my live record. Yeah. At least finishing that one up. And then, you know, just focusing more on the writing stuff, you know, the, you know, the, the outside, you know, TV, whatever, you know what I'm saying? So that, that's a cool, that's a cool thing to get in, involved with. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, cause then you could just choose the gigs you want to actually go. Mm go play or the tours like you don't have to be a slave to the the gigs oh, to like one of my mentors, yeah one of my mentors um 
taught me that stuff, man, because he literally uh, just wakes up every day because he converted his garage into a studio. He just wakes up every day and just walks to his garage and just do music all day. And that's what yeah. he does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's it. That's he does. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Uh well, what do you do, man? Do you want to? Uh, what's the URL to your website? You want to do a shout out so that uh, yeah, you know, if someone up, listens to this in a couple months, you know, if yeah. they find it in a couple months from now, will you have your website up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna get that website up uh, in a couple <laughs> of weeks. Actually, in a couple of weeks, I'm actually going to uh, release a base course. Oh, cool. Uh, I'm working with uh this company uh, uh Spectrum Digital. Spectrum um, Digital. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and gear guides. You, you have the gear guides? No. Okay. Okay. So they're very uh, popular, like you, other YouTube, uh, other YouTubers. Yeah. And we're all gonna collab, and I'm gonna re- release a, like a base course, like literally starting from the beginning. Okay. Uh, literally, just the the bare minimum, learning how to strum a string. Yeah, yeah. Like holding the bass, like how, like tuning it, everything. Yeah. I'm yeah. gonna have. Uh, examples i'm gonna have stems where the players can download the stems and practice i'm gonna have pdf files of everything i'm gonna have different ways to play scales different ways to play grooves like different i'm, I'm literally taking it back to the beginning the basics you cool. know what i'm saying cool yeah. no uh no gimmicks no fancy stuff on this course literally how to, 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 to do the basics then future courses i'm gonna take it up i'm gonna keep taking it up but i'm gonna take it from sure. the beginning okay you know what i'm saying cool that's that's going to be the next thing that that's going to be the, the very next thing that I'm going to release pretty soon. Okay. And, uh, and of course, by the end, I'm going to have my, um, uh, website up. Of course. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'll, I mean, you'll need the website. That <laughs> yeah. So cool. Uh, man, uh, dude, it's been great. Thanks for taking the yeah, time man. to do this. That was my talk with Anthony Crawford. Uh, I will have a link up to his YouTube channel. Um, I love, I love kind of how he used where he got some of his inspiration from. So when people would suggest that he kind of dumb it down or, or play a certain way to fit, fit a role or to fit in um, how he's just like, yeah, no, no, I'm not doing that. I'm doing my thing and how he used so much of this kind of this negativity almost that he would get um, and how he used that as fuel to just kind of get amped up and and continue to pursue uh, who he was on the instrument. I love that. I love that. And just really being an individual, I think, I think it's very easy to get caught up in trying to sound like somebody else all the time um, because I mean, that that's a discussion in and of itself, right? All these people that are high profile bass players are like, well, that's good. So I have to sound just like that to be good. False, false. I think the the idea there is to learn from them and we can what we can, you know, absorb from them and then but still still be us, still be us. And so I think even the advice that Anthony Crawford received from his father back in the day of, you know, do it your way. That's the best. That's the best. And uh, Anthony has had a very strong career based on those principles. I think that's absolutely amazing. If you are enjoying the Bass Shed podcast, please subscribe uh, on whatever platform you are listening to it on. It's on Apple Music, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify. It's on some other ones. It's on some other ones, too. I honestly, like straight up, have no idea how it got there. I have no idea how it's on Podbean, but it, but it's on Podbean. Um, you know, I, I look over the analytics every once in a while, and I'm always fascinated by like, oh, what? How did that happen? Okay. Huh. Interesting. Anyways, wherever you're listening to it, hit subscribe. Uh, as always, if there's someone you'd like to hear from on the podcast, email me at Ryan at the shed.com. We'll see if we can uh, make that happen and bring that, bring that interview to you. That's all I got folks. That's it. That's it for this one. I will catch you on the next one in a minute.